So Dr. Karen Gunther is a professor here in psychology, and she is she comes to us from California, but also other areas of the Midwest, and she has taught at Wabash here since 2007. Uh, her primary research focuses on color vision, which is sort of um, a very broad overview of what we'll talk about tonight. And she conducts research in psychophysics, which as someone with degrees in history, I cannot wait to learn <laughs> maybe what that is because I have no idea. Um, she is also an avid quilter, chef, reader, and a cat lover. She has a cat named Sushi. So Dr. Gunther, welcome. And thank you so much for taking an hour out of your evening to be with us today. I will go ahead and turn this over to you. Okay. And do you want to also mute other people? Other people. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, when I am doing PowerPoint, I cannot see anything in um, in Zoom. So if you have questions, um, post those in the chat. Emily will be watching those. And then after the talk, then I can... I'll come back out of PowerPoint and then I can answer questions. So let me make sure I do this right. Oops. What's that one? No, oh, actually, yeah, hold on one second. I'm not doing it right. See, I'm out of practice now that we're back in person, fortunately. Oops, got to get to the beginning. All right. So I am talking about comparative color vision today. Um, I will start with some humans since we are one type of critter and then cover a bunch of other critters. Each one has interesting different color vision. Um, but first I wanna talk a little bit about why color vision, why in studying this. Um, before I was 12 or when I was little, I thought I would be an artist when I grew up. Um, I crocheted and weaved from way back. I don't even remember when I first learned. Uh, one grandmother knitted a lot, one sewed a lot, although she didn't do quilting. Um, by the time I got to middle school, I thought I'd go into some sort of science or math. And then my undergrad major was biopsychology. Yes, at Oberlin, so go Oberlin this weekend. Uh, by the way, Oberlin did beat Wabash in football the year I got tenure, so it is possible. Um, Oberlin has month of January called winter term where we can do a different project. And my freshman year, I did weaving. Uh, sophomore year, I did half time spinning, um, learning how to spin yarn, and then half time immunology research. Junior year, I did quilting and apprenticeship um, in Denver, and then. I thought I might want to switch to architecture. So senior year, I did an apprenticeship in architecture, decided it wasn't as much more creative than science as I had thought. So I stayed in uh, biopsych, neuroscience, that area. Um, and then for three years between undergrad and grad, I worked at Abbott Labs up north of Chicago. Um, during that time, I took a hand quilting adult class and got addicted to quilting. Then when I applied to grad school and I went to the University of California in San Diego, I wanted to combine my music. I'd played violin since age seven or my quilting with science. And so I got my master's in music perception and then my PhD in color vision. I did my postdoctoral fellowship in the molecular genetics underlying color vision. And I just realized I forgot to say where that was. Uh, that was at the Medical College of Wisconsin up in Milwaukee. Um, and then the quilt behind me, I don't know if you can see it now, I can't see it, but when I'm back out of PowerPoint, um, that is a Japanese maple tree quilt that I made for my parents. So let's start with human color vision. Um, you may already know that we have three cone types, often called red, green, and blue. Um, vision scientists don't call them red, green, and blue, partly because the wavelengths that they maximally respond to are not those colors. Also, if you have a single cone type, you don't see the world in shades of say red, you see it in shades of just black, white, and gray. So we call them long wavelength sensitive or L, medium wavelength sensitive or M, and short wavelength sensitive or S. I will try and stick to the red, green, blue terminology, but I am now so used to L, M, and S that I might slip up at some point tonight. Uh, the photopigment is the chemical in the cones that absorbs the photons of light. I will be also referring to that as we go through the different critters. 
So humans can see from 400 to 700 nanometers. And then you can see the spectra of the three different cone types. Um, I drew these in a drawing program and the ends curl up a little bit more than they actually should. But the peaks are at the peak of those, uh, where those cone types respond best to. So the red ones respond best to the long wavelengths, the green ones to medium wavelengths and the blue to short. And you can see that they're not peaking right in red. So again, that's one of the reasons we don't call them red, green, and blue. People often ask why men are more often colorblind than women. This shows a piece of the X chromosome where the red and the green photopigment genes are in tandem array. Men have one X, women have two. The blue cones are off on chromosome seven. Men and women both have two copies of those. So if a man inherits an array that is missing one or the other cone type, he will be colorblind. If a woman inherits an array that is missing either cone type, she still has her second X as a, back, as a backup. However, well, even if she misses or if she gets two bad Xs like this, so that she has one that is, has the red photopigment gene, but not the green and the other the opposite, she still has her full complement of cone types. So she will still have normal color vision. In order for a woman to be colorblind, she needs to have inherited two bad X's and both bad the same way. Um, that is possible. About half or half of a percent of people, of women are colorblind. So what does the world look like to somebody who is red, green, colorblind? Um, on the left, we can see this fruit stand with, as we see it for a normal trichromat. And then on the right, this is how somebody with red, green colorblindness would see it. And you can see they are not totally blind to colors. There's definite blues and yellows and blacks and whites. So somebody who is red, green, colorblind, they could easily tell the bananas because those are an unusual shape amongst fruits. They would have trouble telling the difference between a green unripe banana and a yellow just ripe banana. But once it gets more ripe and it gets the brown spots on it, they will be able to tell that that is a more ripe banana. The tomatoes presumably look shiny to them. Um, these cucumbers or zucchinis, I can't tell those apart with normal color vision. I can just tell their shape. These things up in front, to me, they look like grapefruits. I discriminate grapefruits from oranges based on their color. Somebody who's red, green, colorblind probably would based on size, given that grapefruits are often larger than oranges are. This is the same kind of vision that any critter who is red, green, colorblind would see. So I'm going to first start uh, with non-humans, with squirrel monkeys, because they are an interesting model system and have implications for potential gene therapy for red-green colorblindness. So on this figure, the dashed lines are where the human spectra are, and then the gray lines are where the squirrel monkeys' uh, different cone types are. They do also have S cones, which I haven't shown on here. So squirrel monkeys are different than humans in that each X chromosome has only one spot for something, a red or green cone type, the gene for a red or green cone type, unlike humans where each X has two spots. So this means a male squirrel monkey, he gets one X chromosome from his mother. Um, he only has that plus the S cone. And so he will be dichromatic. He will be colorblind. These three gray curves are showing that there's three alleles out there in the gene pool. So a girl squirrel monkey who gets an X from both mom and dad, if she gets two different X chromosomes, so two different cone types, she will be trichromatic. Turns out that she does not need any extra wiring, any extra neural wiring. Just having that extra gene for that extra cone type allows her to be behaviorally a trichromat. If that girl, girl squirrel monkey inherits, my pointer's not working here, um, if she inherits two genes that are the same cone type, she will also be a dichromat. So how do we know what squirrel monkeys can see? Uh, one way is that we can do psychophysics with squirrel monkeys just as we can with humans. So this would represent a touch screen. You'd first want to train the monkey to even just touch the screen, probably smear some peanut butter on it, get the monkey to, to touch that. And then maybe start out with black versus white, get the monkey to start learning. Okay, when he touches the one that is a different from the other two, he gets a reward. And then you can start testing color vision as shown here, 
So we would want the monkey to pick the green one because that is the one that is different from the other two. This is a video I'll show you in a second of Dalton. He is a um, squirrel monkey that used to be, he unfortunately passed away, um, but he was one of my postdoc advisor squirrel monkeys and he is doing this color vision test. And you might hear the bell when he gets it right. And then he gets a juice reward. He likes white grape juice. When he misses it, he gets a buzzer and a timeout. And then you can see his super cute little face. And then coming up in a little bit, he's debating which side is it on? Where is it? Oops, go ahead to the next one. All right. So my postdoc advisors have commented that for whatever reason, girl squirrel monkeys like to use their finger to touch the right button. Boy squirrel monkeys like to use their nose um, or their tongue to touch the right one. Either way, if they get the one that is different, they get their treat. <clears throat> so cats and dogs have not actually been studied all that much, their color vision, um, but we do know that they are dichromats. They are red-green colorblind like um, the male squirrel monkeys, unlike some uh, humans, actually about 8% of Caucasian men are color red-green colorblind. So that applies to both cats and dogs. Um, these are actually my former cats, hippocampus on top and amygdala on the bottom. And you might notice that their eyes are really glowy. This is because nocturnal animals have a tapetum lucidum on the backs of their retinas. This is a reflective lining. So if a photon of light comes into our eye, there's a chance that it might get absorbed by either a rod or a cone, or it might not. In humans, it will then be absorbed by the back of the retina. For critters that have a tapetum lucidum, that missed photon will bounce back off and reflect off and have a second chance at being absorbed by a rod or a cone. One problem with this shown down here in this, sorry, slightly blurry image is that the photon will bounce off at an equal but opposite angle. So that means, although they get two chances at capturing those photons, they, uh, the image will get blurred out. However, it does improve their night vision. Um, this was a photographic error. Uh, this is my current cat, Sushi. I hit the um, photo button as I was raising the camera, but it used Professor, the flash. I'm gonna, Look at, huh? I'm going to interrupt Professor for a second. Sorry. Um, someone in the chat says that there's a, a uh, block on the top of your presentation screen. There's like a gray bar. I can see it too. Do I don't something? know how to get, that's a Zoom thing. Okay. Well, um, I guess let's keep that in mind. If there's like a title of the slide or something that we're missing, could you maybe tell us? Otherwise, um, we'll just roll with it. Yeah, I don't know. Now there's a big gray box. Yeah, I was just looking to see if there's a way to move that. I don't know how to move it. Someone in chat suggests resize the presentation screen. Let me see if I can. Oh, now they're saying it's good. It is good now? I think we're just going to roll with it because it's it's back again now. So Okay, yeah, when I went into presentation mode, it yeah, it took over the whole screen again. Yep. All right, I will keep in mind that you don't see titles. All right, thanks. Uh, this one doesn't have a title, so you're not missing anything on this one. Um, but again, this was my cat, my current cat, Sushi, photographic mistake. I was bringing up the um, phone as I accidentally hit the button, but I was just amazed at the reflection from her tapetum lucida. So reindeer also have interesting tapetum lucida. Um, These beautiful animals are Arctic reindeer, and we've discovered that the eyes of Arctic reindeer change color throughout the season. Hold on, it's not, this one is not expanding for me. It's from gold to blue, adapting to extreme changes in light levels in their environment, which helps them detect predators like wolves. This is the first time a color change of this kind in the eye has been shown in a mammal. My research team from University College London is funded by the BBSRC, 
and with our colleagues at the University of Tromsø in Arctic Norway, we regularly travel up to the Arctic Circle as you can see in these stunning vistas. By studying the reindeer for many years over seasons, we've shown that the colour change in their eyes helps reindeer to see better in the three months of continuous daylight of summer and the continuous darkness of the long Arctic winters. And the eyes manage this by changing the sensitivity of the retina to light. Most people are familiar with the way that cat's eyes reflect light back to enhance night vision. In fact, many animals have this reflective layer. It's called the tapetum lucidum, or TL for short. Arctic reindeer possess this reflective layer too, and by changing its colour, the TL reflects different wavelengths of light. This image is a close-up of a reindeer's eye and shows that in the bright light of summer, the TL in the Arctic reindeer is gold, similar to many other mammals, which reflects light mostly directly back through the retina. This image shows the eye in winter. As you can see, it's changed to a deep blue, which reflects less light out of the eye. This change scatters more light through the photoreceptors at the back of the eye, increasing sensitivity of the retina in response to the limited winter light. We believe that this would be an advantage in the prolonged murk of winter. This ties in nicely with our previous research that has shown that Arctic reindeer can also see ultraviolet which is abundant in Arctic light but is invisible to humans and that they use this to find food and see predators. The blue reflection from the winter eye is likely to favour ultraviolet sensitivity. In case you're wondering how we know so much about this huge animal, it's by working with the Sami, the indigenous people of the area and these animals are their primary source of income. Many reindeer are killed around the solstices for their meat and their eyes shown in this study come from these animals. It's one of the few parts of the animal not used by the Sami. The animal in this picture is not dead, it's just been given a sedative. It was bought directly from the Sami herders 70 degrees north outside Tromso in Arctic Norway. It's being prepared to have a small gold foil electrode placed under its eyelid to record the electrical activity and sensitivity of the retina. The animal is recovered and returned to the field, but comes back consecutive summer and winter solstices so that we can see how retinal sensitivity changes between the seasons. In fact, we never found the upper limit of sensitivity in the winter eyes, so it's likely to be significantly greater. I'm going to just go back to regular PowerPoint and see if then you can see. Um, is that going to be too small of an image? So is this better? Uh, the person who brought it up in the chat says that looks fine. Okay. So we're going to have the rest of the um, PowerPoint stuff, but at least you can see the whole slide now. All right, so um, the shiny loose jaw and the black loose jaw on the next slide are also interesting model systems. They live way down deep in the ocean, down below where the sunlight gets. So seawater absorbs longer wavelengths better. So most critters that are down there do have bioluminescence, so they produce their own light, but it is in the blue-green range because that travels better. The shiny and black loose jaws both have long wavelength light uh, bioluminescence. And you can see here, so again, the dashed lines are the human spectra, and then the solid lines are the shiny loose jaws. So this guy is a trichromat. He has basically two types of green cone, or maybe a green one and a yellow one. And then his red one is much longer than ours is. It absorbs quite a bit longer wavelengths than ours does. Their red bioluminescence is way out here, so even they can just barely see it. We may not be able to see their uh, red bioluminescence very well at all. And then the black loose jaw also has red bioluminescence in addition to the normal uh, blue-green bioluminescence. Theirs is at 705 nanometers. Again, humans see only 400 to 700. So again, we may not be able to see this bioluminescence. This guy has only two cone types, both in the green range, nowhere near out in his where his bioluminescence is. It turns out that they have a derivative of chlorophyll in their cones that absorbs the 705 nanometer bioluminescence 
and then re-emits it down at a shorter wavelength that their cone types can pick it up. Um, you can also see up here, here's a black lucia about to eat this yummy shrimp. So the shrimp, because there's very little red wavelengths down that far down in the ocean, he does not have the ability to perceive the long wavelengths, the red wavelengths. So he is blind to the spotlight. In addition, because there are so few long wavelengths way down deep in the ocean, there has not been selective pressure against reflecting those wavelengths. And so this little shrimp is really reflecting the long wavelengths and is blind to the fact that he is doing so. And so he has no idea that he's about to be lunch. Uh, whales are also interesting. They should be dichromats, but in their blue cone photopigment gene, they actually have a uh, stop codon at amino acid 90. So they only produce the first 89 of what should be about 360 amino acids in their photopigment. So therefore their S cones are non-functional. They do have, or their S cones are blue cones. They do have red cones. However, in order to be able to see color, you need to have at least two cone types. With a single cone type, you only see the world in shades of black, white, and gray. So yes, they can see, but not in color. Goldfish, on the other hand, are tetrachromats. So here I have this a uh, little bit different from the previous figures. The vertical lines are the peaks of the human spectral sensitivities. Hold on, Professor. And then the black line. Someone else Pardon says me? They can't, Professor, someone else says they can't see your screen at all. Is they can't see it at all? Yep. Folks, can someone unmute and let me know whether that's just one person or whether that's all of you? It's, it's now okay. Just got okay and was blocked for until up till now. Okay. All right. Great. I'm glad it's resolved. So I just went back to full screen. So then you won't be able to see the title now. So did you see? Could you see the whales? Someone else says they could see the whole thing the entire time. It may have just been someone's specific computer because I could okay. see the whole thing too. Would you like me to stay in the small one or go back to full screen? Any please preferences? Stay, yeah, please stay in uh, when you have now. Okay, I will. I, I agree. Right. It works now. Okay, good. So goldfish, they're technically. Could you possibly go back to the whales? I'm particularly interested in whales and I missed all that because I couldn't see your screen. Okay, can you see the whales now? No. Um can you see the whales now? No. No, yeah. I, yes, no. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I can see him too. I see him with the uh gray bar at the top. Okay. We may just have to deal with the gray bar, folks. I'm sorry about that. We can deal with the gray bar. It's seeing the rest works now. Okay. So do you guys still want me to redo whales? Please. Okay. So okay. whales should be dichromats. Um, they have kind of genes for both blue and red cones, except that the blue ones have a mutation at amino acid 90, which means that they produce the first 89 amino acids of what should be about 360 amino acids on that photopigment. So it is a non-functional blue cone. They do have red cones, but with only a single cone type, they cannot perceive different colors. They can only perceive the world in shades of black, white, and gray. So goldfish, on the other hand, are not just monochromats, but they are tetrachromats. So here we have on the vertical lines, these are where the, the human cones peak, and then the black lines are the goldfish. So you can see that the goldfish have a red cone, but it is much longer wavelength than ours, probably going into what for humans is infrared. Their green is pretty similar to ours. Their blue is a little bit longer than ours. And then they also have a UV one, which we do not have. Um, this figure is showing a, um, a goldfish showing that he has color constancy. So color constancy is the fact that an object, say a banana, looks yellow, whether we're looking at it um, outside in the regular sunlight, at sunset and the red wavelengths and the red light, um, under a green forest canopy, underwater where it's, there's more of a blue tone, that banana still looks yellow. Our brains can say at sunset, there's a lot of red wavelengths. Let's ignore those and pay attention to the differences. 
goldfish can do the same thing. So if you train the goldfish to peck at this yellow, give him some little food treats whenever he pecks at it, and then shine a blue light over everything, this yellow will actually look white. But if the goldfish can say, okay, everything's reflecting a lot of blue wavelengths, what is the most yellow? The goldfish can do that. And he exhibits that he does in fact have color constancy. Not all critters do. Pigeons are also tetrachromats. So the next time you look down on a pigeon, keep in mind that he may be looking back at you and thinking, oh, you poor colorblind trichromatic person, if only you could see all the colors that are out there. So they have red cones, green that are a bit shorter than ours, blue cones, and then also UV ones. Um, pigeons are also interesting in that, so here's a picture of a cone. The photopigments that are absorbing the photons of light are out here. This is where the um, UV, blue, green, or red would be. It would be just one of those in any given cone. In the inner segment of the cone, pigeons have um, oil droplets, either clear, small yellow, large yellow, orange, or red. They would have one type in any given cone. The light counterintuitively comes up from the bottom of the cone. It would then pass through the oil droplet, acting as a filter to restrict the number of photons, the wavelengths that get out to where these um, photopigments are that will absorb the photons. So that gives the pigeon a lot more um, dimensions of their color vision. There are not all possible combinations of the four photopigments and the four oil droplets, but many of them do exist in the pigeon eye. Monarchs are also interesting. They have only three cone types. They're actually insects, so they have omatidia instead of cones, but they're analogous. Um, but they have green, blue, and UV. However, they're orange and they can make good orange distinctions better than their cone type should allow. So this paper found, this is looking at their omatidia. Again, these are the um, insect equivalent of cones. And you can see these little orange dots. Those are orange pigments that are absorbing the wavelengths in some of their omatidia, but not others. So that means out, if I go back um, out in this long wavelength region where they only have the one cone type, they can actually make better distinctions, discriminations than they should be able to do. Um, this paper I was particularly pleased with, I stumbled on it when I was trying to close out my NSF grant, looking for a model of the product project's outcomes report. Um, first of all, it has another critter with interesting color vision, but I mentioned earlier that I got addicted to quilting this year was the first year that I submitted a quilt to the Cherrywood Fabrics Challenge, and their challenge this year was monarchs. So at the beginning of the summer, I was intensively studying monarch wings. This is my quilt that I submitted. Um, it got accepted in their show, and it is now traveling around the country for the next roughly year and a half. Um, so in this study, they also wanted to see, do monarchs actually have color vision, or are they just using a brightness cue? So they trained the monarchs to feed at artificial flowers that were either purple, blue, red, or yellow in different groups of monarchs. And then they tested that color plus many grays of different brightnesses. And the monarchs picked the color of the colored flower overwhelmingly. So if you have a monarch that's been trained to go for the um, purple artificial flower, he was tested with purple and then all of these different grays you can see there's some right around here. This is looking at reflectance. So there's some right around there that are the same brightness, but that monarch picks purple about 97% of the time. And the authors collapse across all of the other different grays. They hardly ever picked, the monarchs hardly ever picked any gray flower. Monarchs trained on blue, same thing. They went for the blue flower, not any of the other grays, even the ones of equal brightness. Uh, yellow trained monarchs also went for yellow, not the neighboring grays and the red ones also. So they all really like the colors. It's not just brightness. So bees are um, apparently the best studied color vision of any species outside of human, according to Jerry Jacobs, who has done a lot of work with non-human color vision. 
Um, he is also one of my academic grandfathers. So here we have, again, the vertical lines are where the peaks of the human cones are, and then the bees are in black. So the bees can see from orange down to UV. They are trichromats. They have um, one cone type or omatidia type out here, kind of in the same range of both of our green and red. They have one similar to our blue, and then they also have UV. Um, this flower is shown as a human would see it, just a uh, uniform yellow, and then with a UV filter. Many flowers differentially reflect UV, so then that tells the bee, okay, this is where the pollen is, come here to pollinate me. Um, from people who study bees, they have determined that their favorite color is UV and their least favorite color is blue-green. Um, because bees only see up into about orange, most red flowers are not pollinated by bees. Instead, hummingbirds pollinate them. Um, the European corn poppy is an exception. It reflects long wavelengths that we humans see as red, but also UV that the honeybee likes. And then there's snakes. Um, they do have cone types, but they also have a pit organ that allows them to see infrared. So these are pythons, boas, and pit vipers, which include rattlesnakes. They can see 3,000 to 5,000 nanometers. Again, humans can see 400 to 700 nanometers. Snakes can also see 8,000 to 12,000 nanometers. This 8 to 12,000 nanometers is in the range where um, body heat gets emitted. So snakes being cold-blooded, they can have a receptor that can detect body heat. If we humans had this, probably our own body heat would just wipe out that system and it would be non-functional. So they do this um, infrared detection. The title here that's hiding says snake infrared detection. They do this not through their eyes, but through this pit organ that's in their cheek. Um, it's one to two millimeters in diameter, five millimeters deep. It contains six to 7,000 heat sensing thermoreceptor nerve fibers. The receptor is a derivative of the human wasabi receptor. It is extremely sensitive. They can respond to temperature change of about 0 0.003 degrees Celsius. They can discern the presence in total darkness of an animal about 10 degrees Celsius warmer than the ambient temperature in a mere half second at a distance of 40 centimeters. They, they are highly accurate at localizing their prey, rarely off by more than five degrees visual angle, so if you hold your fist out at arm's length, your fist is about 10 degrees across. So this is about a half fist width um, localization. And this is true even in complete darkness. So this bottom figure shows a snake with blindfolds on it. Rem I just want to remind you, these are pythons, boas, pit vipers, rattlesnakes, poisonous snakes. I would not want to do this research. So. And the researchers put little blindfolds on, so they're covering up the eyes, leaving the pit organ um, open. And then here you can see that if the prey is at zero degrees, the snake is really good at detecting that prey and capturing the prey. And then the last critter I'm gonna talk about is the house mouse. Um, so they are unusual in that their cones co-express both photopigment types. So they have both M or green and UV. The top of their retina is mostly expressing the green photopigment. And then in a gradient going down, less and less green, but more and more UV as you get down towards the bottom of their retina. Lenses, um, external lenses, also the lenses in our eyes, flip the image top to bottom. And so this means that the top part of the retina that has the green receptors, that's what's seeing the grass and then the bottom that's seeing the UV, that's seeing the sky. So again, these guys are unusual in that their cones are co-expressing both types of photoreceptors. They have mostly green photopigments at the top, mostly UV at the bottom, and then a mix in the middle. So this might possibly even make them somewhat trichromatic. Um, I don't know if behavioral studies have been done on mice. All right, so. I will get out of this and stop sharing. 
And then I see there's 17 comments in the chat. Yes, and lots are discussion about the screen, but let me okay. pull some questions. Um, someone points out that you got tenure in 2012. Um, our only other loss to Oberlin was in 1945. So for us just to take that into consideration. Yes, um, um, Oberlin does not normally talk much about football. Uh, but that fall, all the newsletters they sent out said not since 1945. Finally, Oberlin beat Wabash in football. It could happen again on Saturday. It could. And, you know, you're in charge tonight, so we'll all hush. Um, let's see. And I'm tenured now, so they can't find yes, me for that. One. There you go. Um, OK, so someone wants to know this was a question from 707. So towards the beginning of your lecture, they want to know about partial colorblindness. Could you speak more on partial colorblindness? So most of what we call colorblind people are actually red green colorblind. They are not fully colorblind. Um, as I showed earlier on, they see the world in shades of blues and yellows and blacks and whites. There are some people are, who are full achromats. So they only see the world in shades of black, white, and gray. But most people who we call colorblind can see blues and yellows and blacks and whites. Okay, let's see. Um... All right. Um, what animal did you find the most interesting to study and why? I don't know. They're all, I mean, it's interesting just in the whole that there are so many different ways of seeing color, so many different mechanisms. Um, I don't know if I have a favorite. I mean, my favorite animal is cat, but here, here. They're just dichromats, so. Um, is it true that the brain invents a lot of what we think we see? There is a lot of top-down influence on our perception. Um, so I've seen, so we often, you've heard the quote, seeing is believing. It's also somewhat believing is seeing. So what you think you're going to see, what you think you're going to perceive, does definitely influence what you do then perceive how you perceive things. Um, okay, here's a question specifically about the vision of whales. Is there a difference in uh, which colors some whales see as compared to others? For example, um, let's see, I think there might be a typo here, um, baleen whales um, as compared to other whales? I do not know whales en well enough to say. Okay. Sorry. Um, as a as a whole, maybe is there is there um, a, could there be a difference in the way that certain cats see versus other cats or certain I mean based on what you know could there be a possibility that some animals of a species see differently than others in their same species? Yes, I mean certainly we see that in humans, um, and I did mention in the squirrel monkeys that the male squirrel monkeys are all dichromats, so they're all red green colorblind. Some female squirrel monkeys are trichromats, so that's normal color vision. Um, within humans, you can have a problem with your red cones or missing your red cones, missing your green cones. Much rarer, some people are missing their blue cones. So they then see the world in shades of reds and greens and blacks and whites. Um, and then there are some people um, who are totally missing all cone types. If anyone's familiar with Oliver Sacks' book, The Island of the Colorblind, that talks about people who are rod monochromats. So they have no functioning cones, only rods. They see the world in shades of black, white, and gray. So given that there are those mutations in humans, um, I would not be surprised if there were similar mutations in non-humans that would reduce them uh, their color vision from what I was talking about today. Probably not enhance them. Um, other than Dalton, who you saw, and one other male squirrel monkey who my postdoc advisors did give sub subretinal injections to to give them the missing cone type, and that did turn them into trichromatic monkeys. Are there any drugs that affect color perception? I guess maybe you just talked about that a little bit, but. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, someone else wants to know, are you aware of the studies on horseshoe crab vision? Um, somewhat, I know that, um, so something called lateral inhibition was first studied in 
uh, horseshoe crab. So that's where the second layer of cells in the retina compare the signals from the central cone to surrounding cones. And that mechanism I know was first studied in horseshoe crabs. Um, I don't know about horseshoe crab color vision. I know that they have blue blood, but okay. Um, I don't so know what they see. Someone else has a follow-up to the drugs that affect color perception. Um, someone else asked the same question um, just coincidentally and says um, that they're aware of an anecdote of airline pilots reporting color changes after using Viagra. I don't know. Um, I do know when I was in my postdoc, um, we had a guest speaker who was working on, um, he had a grad student who at one point had picked up the newspaper, tried to read it and said, oh, my blood sugar is too low. I can't read it. And so this guy then got interested in this and found out that it is common if your blood sugar gets too low, your vision gets worse. And while he was gearing up to study this stuff, he had not even applied for grant, not published anything yet. He got a call from the Air Force. Um, he later asked them how they knew he was studying this and they just said they have their ways. But this person said that they know when their pilots are up, they send them up with a candy bar and a Coke because if their blood pressure, their blood sugar also drops, their vision gets worse. And so they gave them stuff to keep their blood sugar up. So that's not color vision changing, that's vision in general getting worse. That's wild. Um, see, can humans, quotes, see with other organs, not our eyes, um, other parts of our body? Um, not, um, not directly seeing. Um, there are some uh, starting to be some retinal prostheses um, but I think that is still implanted in the eye. Certainly when you touch like blind people using Braille, if you have them in a fMRI so you can see their brain, um, their brain activity, when they are reading Braille, it is the visual cortex that lights up. So this is in blind people who otherwise don't have input to that part, but they're not really seeing, they're perceiving, but not really seeing. Um, there is also an interesting uh, TED talk by Neil Harbison, who is, um, he's an achromat, so he cannot see any colors. He then created a device that is actually now embedded into his skull. It's a little thingy that hangs down in front of his face, and it looks to me kind of like a California quail, but it picks up on wavelengths, and then it gives him different signals, different tones, depending on which color is out there. So he can now perceive color. I don't think I would say he's seeing it, but he's hearing color. And so he now has a way to make those discriminations. Um, someone comments lovely quilt about the quilt behind you. Um, Thank you. Someone says, I'm red, green, colorblind, and I've created many coping mechanisms like shape, brightness, and texture. I assume you witnessed such coping mechanisms in animals, and if so, what kind of strategies do they use, and do any stand out to you? Um, I also saw flashed by somebody commented on dog whiskers. So, I mean, there are animals that use more whiskers um, rather than vision. Um, I don't know if you would say that a cat is using coping mechanisms because they're not living in a trichromatic world. So it's not like the other cats are saying, well, what's your problem? Why can't you make this discrimination? Um, they're just living in their cat world. So they have, they do have other senses. Um, cats are definitely more smell oriented than humans are. Humans are much more vision oriented. So, I mean, if a cat, you know, if I wanna know what's this thing on the floor, I look at it, my cat goes and smells it. So. Is that a coping mechanism? Is that just a species difference? I don't know. Okay. Um, back to the drugs affecting vision. Someone says um, that just to add on to their previous comment, they were thinking a lot of drugs target G protein coupled receptors, which may include optics, opsins. Yeah. Yes. Yes, but there's a whole lot of G protein coupled receptors in the in the brain body. So 
I would think they would have to be much more targeted than just any old G protein coupled receptors. Um, it is possible that some of those do affect vision. I am just not aware of them. Um, is the ultraviolet ray range of humans and animals always fixed throughout their lifetimes, or could psychological or neurological effects lead to fluctuations in this range? So humans cannot see UV. Um, this guy I mentioned, Neil Harbison, who has a little thingy um, to detect the wavelengths, he has now changed that so he can perceive UV. So he goes outside and he hears certain pitches that tell him, oh, the UV is really high today. But humans cannot see UV. It would be handy because that's what burns our skin, uh, but we cannot see it. Um, the video on the, um, the reindeer did say that in the Arctic winter, their tapetum lucida do change so that they're reflecting much shorter wavelengths down into the UV. And so that helps them perceive um, more stuff in the winter. So for them, they do change seasonally. Um, I don't know enough about uh, the development of bees or goldfish to know if baby bees and baby goldfish also see UV or not. Okay. Um, the gentleman who brought up dog whiskers just a few minutes ago when we were talking about animal coping mechanisms or species differentiation, differentiation says um, their dog is blind and that the dog if it's in a new room, it has learned how to study the room to find mm. their way around. So studying it by sitting there or by going around and feeling it carefully. I could see that they could maybe bark and listen to the echoes. Apparently some people can echolocate as well. And bats too, they use, um, rather than vision, they use echolocation to navigate. So that's a, you might call it a coping mechanism. Okay, yep, yeah, they say the dog walks around and feels the room with their whiskers. Hmm, interesting. Okay, um, someone else says infrared lets animals see heat. What is the advantage of seeing UV besides just it burns our skin? Um, so a lot of flowers do differentially reflect UV where the pollen is. So pollinators can tell where that... Um, where the UV is. Um, I don't know necessarily what advantages there are. I mean, it's kind of, why don't we see everything? That would be nice if we could see even more wavelengths than we can. Um, neurons are expensive metabolically, so we can't have all possible senses. So, I mean, there's an awful lot of red flowers, so it might be advantageous for the bees to be able to see more red and not just stop at orange, but evolution gets us to good enough, not to perfect. <laughs> um, someone else is interested. If you have anything else you can say about cat color vision, they're interested in hearing more about cats. No, um, other than they're just red, green, dichromat, red, green, colorblind. Okay. Um, okay, so someone else says the blind dog, the, they took the vet, they took the dog to the vet who was an ophthalmologist, and someone else has asked this other alum, what did the ophthalmologist say about the dog? <laughs> so we'll see. I know cats can get cataracts because my cat's uh, hippocampus almost made it to age 21, and she definitely had cataracts. And I saw on the um, sign up list, I don't see the kitties here. But I saw that um, Tom Keedy had RSVP'd and his wife is actually our vet. I don't okay. think I see them on the call though. Okay, okay. Um, another alum says human color blindness can be mitigated by color filtering glasses. Have similar approaches been used to expand the range of human color vision? No, and those glasses, well, how well they work is very questionable. So yeah, um, I mean, there are, I should I should back off on that. There are definitely um, infrared goggles that um, the military uses. So in that sense, that is a type of glasses that is expanding our vision. We do have um, different kinds of detectors that can detect UV, all sorts of different um, wavelengths that we can't see with our eyes. So 
Whether it's an, a device that we can wear on us is a different question, but we certainly have invented devices that can perceive a whole bunch of things that we can't. Um, another thing is not in color vision, but a number of birds can follow magnetic pathways. Humans can't without a compass. So there's a lot of things out there that other critters can do that we can't, or at least we can't just biologically. All right. Um, the gentleman with the blind dog says the eye doctor showed him his dog's retinas. They were like raisins. They were like what? Raisins, the food. Oh. Um, okay, let's see. Um, uh, someone else says, when I work with beehives, should I wear a red bee suit instead of white? I don't know enough about bee behavior. Um, that would look black to them. And would that freak them out? Would they not like a black, a large black thing coming at them as opposed to a large white thing? I don't know. You would not be able to sneak up on them. You would not be invisible. You would just be black rather than colored. So I don't know if what they would think of a black thing approaching them versus a white thing. Okay, we've got more commentary on the dog about how the dog reads and orients himself to the room. I wish we could see this dog, sir. <laughs> Mr. Coulter, is there a way? Um, okay, here's another question. Is there some contemporary molecular genetics evidence that might provide clues about ancient dinosaur color vision? That's cool. I have not heard dinosaur color vision. Um, cones probably don't fossilize. I don't know um, how much of the molecular genetics they could see. I don't know if somebody's, I should look at that. Um, there have been, historians have claimed that because Homer didn't talk much about blue, that humans could not perceive blue back in ancient Greek times. Um, that is not true. The blue-yellow system is actually older than the red-green. So we could perceive blue. Um, there is an interesting parallel that um, there are some claims that societies did not have a term for a color until they could produce that color artificially. And so the Greeks apparently could not produce blue artificially. The Egyptians could, and they did have a term for blue. So not a perception, but a more of a linguistic thing. Oh, is that the doggy? Let's see, I've got to scroll to see this dog. Oh, yay! Oh, everyone, if you can look at the Coulter screen, the dog, yes! I guess there's no point in waving to the poor dog. Yeah, I can put us on gallery. There we go. Oh, the dog is waving! <laughs> oh, he can't see us, but we love him. That's funny. Um. Okay, another question. Thank you for showing us the dog. He's I think the dog and the whales and the cats are the highlight <laughs> of tonight. Um, let's see, we know how human genetics affects color blindness. Is there something in cat genetics that might allow some cats to have better vision? Um, I don't know about better color vision. I mean, certainly any um, gene therapy that we figure out how to do, we figured out how to do it in squirrel monkeys. So therefore it could be done to cats too. Um, I don't know how a cat would like seeing extra colors. Um, there is something else interesting about cats. They are often used in um, developmental studies, studying the development of vision. And I think part of that, I mean, they're born with their eyes closed, um, but their visual system is much more plastic, much more malleable after birth than other critters. Critters that are prey, they tend to have pretty fixed brains when they're born, but cats in particular, they need to be able to pounce on their prey. And if they're pouncing on a mouse and they're an inch off, the mouse is gone, no lunch. And so after they're born, their visual system can adapt itself to get better depth perception, see how well the muscles can turn the eyes in and get everything adjusted and attuned to their particular visual system. So there's much more plasticity after birth than there is um, in many other creatures. So I think that's why kittens in particular tend to be used for uh, visual development studies. I would not want to do those studies 
Um, the results are interesting, but if you're gonna do a study on the development of the visual cortex in a cat, you get to play with a cute little fuzzy kitten, then you have to chop its head off in order to get to its brain. And I would not be able to do oh, that. Um, at least during evolution, the number of odorant receptors in humans are much fewer than in rodents. A lot of the receptors in humans are pseudogenes. Mm -hmm. Not a question, but just a comment. I think going back to ancient development there. Yes. And um, there are also some anosmias that we have, specific anosmias. So that means there's specific scents that different people cannot smell. Um, we get, I get a lot in my office, these little brown ladybug-like critters. Um, to about half of the people, when you squish them, they really stink. I am in the other half, but often in class, in sensation and perception, when we get to the smell unit, and I'm talking about specific anosmias, I can just say, you know, those little brown ladybug-like things, and half the class just spontaneously goes, oh, those smell horrible. And the other half of the class is like, what are you guys talking about? So there are, even amongst humans with basically normal smell, there are some smells that some people smell and some people don't smell. Okay. Um, we have a couple minutes left while I wait to see if anyone else has a question. I've got one. Um, I also am a cat person and I'm wondering, um, you could buy cat toys, you know, in all shapes and colors, but if I want to buy a cat toy, should I bet my cat will really love and I'm going for something that's really, that stands out to her visually, should that be yellow? Can, based on what we have learned about how cats see? I would say go for one with catnip. Okay. Because you're using a human-centric perspective and saying, well, what does it look like? She's sure. much okay. more olfactory oriented. Okay. So get one that smells good. Um, not all cats respond to catnip either. Um, sushi really does. Her former brother, Sashimi, really did not. A friend gave us fresh catnip and Sushi thought it was the most amazing thing she'd ever had. And Sashimi sniffed it and he's like, it's a leaf. He looked at his sister. He's like, I'm not getting that. So again, there's individual differences, even within species. Yes, that makes sense. Another alum jumped in. Yeah, my cat loves her red toy. She didn't even need catnip. So I guess cat by cat. Yeah. And who knows what that red toy smells like? Or is it a nice texture? Does it toss easier? All right, folks, we want to be respectful of Dr. Gunther's time. So we've got two more minutes. It was a ladybug shaped toy. <laughs> All right. One of Sushi's favorite is a plush wedge of Swiss cheese. <laughs> All right, you guys, we're getting a lot of thank you. Someone says, thank you so much. I'm sorry I had to leave early from five minutes ago. Um, someone else, Dr. Dever says, great lecture. Um, thank you for the interesting lecture. Any final questions in these last few minutes, everyone? This was an amazing lecture. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming and especially to Dr. Gunther for leading this discussion. I learned a lot. I know we all did. Um, I have recorded this session. Um, if you want to receive a link to that once it's posted, let me know. Um, I will talk to Dr. Gunther tomorrow about if it's okay to put on the Wabash YouTube, but if not, I can send you a private box link so you can rewatch it. I know there's some of you who had to leave early. Um, I hope you join us. Yeah, it's fine if you want to post it. Oh, perfect. Okay. Then it will be on YouTube and I can circulate the link next week after we get through homecoming. Thank you for your time and amazing presentation. Please would love the link. So Dr. Deborah, great. We will make that happen. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining and Dr. Gunther for your expertise this evening. I hope to see you this thank weekend. You. Take care, everyone. Thank you.